thank you so much for coming. Um, let's see, first of all, cookies and milk are obligatory announcement. Please feel free to take any. Um, so let me quickly introduce our speaker for today, uh, Dr. Anderson. So Dr. Patrick D. Anderson is currently an assistant professor of philosophy in the Department of Humanities at Central State University. Um, and is the author of Cypherpunk Ethics, Radical Ethics for the Digital Age, published by Routledge. Dr. Anderson was a 2020-2021 Research Justice at the Intersections, Research Justice at the Intersections Fellow at Mills College, and he is the recipient of the 2021 Clifford G. Christians Ethics Research Award and the 2022 Surveillance Studies Network Early Career Research Award. His current research in Africana philosophy examines the social and political philosophy of Eldridge Cleaver, and his current research in ethics explores new territory in the field of voting ethics. And most importantly, he was a philosophy alumnus of UBSU. Mm -hmm. The most important. <laughs> Both student and faculty. That's right, that's right. You got, you got all of it in. So today we're going to hear about On the Duty to Non-Vote, Three Perspectives. So let's welcome Dr. Anderson. I'm, uh, I'm pretty excited about this. Uh, it's part of a bigger project that I've been working on both informally and more recently formally over the last you know eight, nine years or so. Um, what I sort of have always been interested in with voting is how do people come to the choices that they make and not necessarily just in you know what's reasonable or what's not, but also what is ethical and what's not. And over time I started looking at the uh, scholarship in this area, which is very little, but it's starting to grow. Voting ethics is starting to become its own area within social ethics. And I started looking at some of the, the literature and thought, there's a whole bunch of stuff that's being overlooked. And so what I've been developing over the last couple years is a few projects that are going to be put together into a book project. Um, right now, the working title for that is Voting Ethics Reconsidered, but if you have something cooler than that, please tell me so I can use it. Um, <laughs> because all I want to do really is reconsider voting ethics. And um, this presentation here is uh, one slice of that uh, bigger project um, where I want to consider whether or not there might be a duty not just to vote, but to actually a moral duty to abstain from voting altogether in some situations or under certain conditions. So what I'll try to walk through here is a little sort of uh, introduction to the field of voting ethics and the basic questions and texts of this, of this emerging field. Then talk about voting duties as special duties because this is something that is maybe implied in some of the literature but not necessarily explicit and I think that that distinction can kind of help us work through some of these questions. And then I want to pose a new question for the field. Is there a duty to not vote? And if so, under what conditions? And then I'll take three perspectives on that. Simone Veal, uh, W.E.B. Du Bois, and George Carlin. And hopefully this looks eclectic, that's what I wanted it to be, but also hopefully I can you know, persuade everybody here that what I'm going to try to do is give an entirely objective, <laughs> non-biased <laughs> non presentation of all of the, of all of the um, uh, philosophers that we'll be discussing here uh, in, in this talk. So, um, so yeah, so we'll kind of jump in. So there's a lot of different questions that come up in this field. For example, who should have the right to vote? That would be a moral question related to voting ethics. But the two questions that I'm really working with today are, is there a duty to vote? In other words, do you have a duty to go and cast a ballot? Regardless of what's on it, that's the duty. And if you haven't cast the ballot, then you haven't done your duty. You failed in some kind of way. And then the second question is, is there a duty to vote in a particular way? And as we'll see, a lot of scholars say, yes, there is a duty to vote in a particular way, um, although they might cash this out in different terms. And so these are the two central questions I'll be talking about today until we get to a third question of whether or not there's a duty to not vote uh, under some circumstances. The two major works in voting ethics are Jason Brennan's The Ethics of Voting and Julia Maskever's The Duty to Vote. And Brennan kind of takes a libertarian view. He's working through rational choice theory. And one of his central questions is, is it rational for someone to vote? And, uh, um, and then he's also mostly interested in if you are going to vote, you have a duty to vote in a particular way. And then Maskever, she comes out of political science and takes more of a democratic theory approach and says, well, we should look at voting through the lens of civic duty rather than rational choice theory. 
And both of these books are very interested in the question of the duty to vote, but the duty to not vote never really comes up. Um, Brennan might say, well, sometimes it may be irrational to vote, but Dunbar says that there's a duty to abstain all the way. Maskever almost toys with this idea of the duty to not vote, but then kind of says, but we're not really talking about that here. We're assuming that the, that the conditions are met in some kind of way. And so what I'd like to do is unpack that a little bit. But before I do, I'll say a little bit more about these existing uh, works here because it will help us get some context for why what I think I'm presenting today really adds something to the field. So Brennan will say, look, we can, we can consider three arguments for the duty to vote, and for Brennan, all of them fail. So the first one is the agency argument, that voters ought to actually have a causal role to play in bringing about the common good or bringing about the ends of democracy. And he rejects this. He also says that some people will argue that, well, those people who don't vote are just free riders on everyone else's efforts who go to the polls and produce good outcomes for everyone. And so this is what he calls the public goods argument. He's also not convinced by this. And finally, there's the civic virtue argument where voting is actually part of what it means to be a virtuous citizen. And he rejects this as well. Um, he says there are other ways to, if, even if we take civic virtue as an important part of, civic, of citizenship, he says there's other ways to be civically virtuous without voting. And uh, what he wants to conclude then is this thesis here, that citizens typically have no duty to vote at all. But if they do vote, they must vote well. And for him, this is voting on the basis of sound evidence for what will likely promote the common good. That's kind of his perspective. So when we put this back into the context of our two questions here, is there a duty to vote? Brennan says no. But if you do vote, you do have a duty to vote in a particular way, and he says that you should vote in a way that advances the common good, not just self-interest. So you have to have some idea of the common good in mind when you cast your ballot. Maskever, on the other hand, gives three arguments. There's actually a lot more arguments in the book, but these are the central ones here about the duty to vote. And these are the ones she endorses. These are the ones she accepts. And she says, first we have the voting in Good Samaritanism argument. And she says, this view is informed by a principle of minimal altruism, meaning that most ethical theories believe that you've got some basic duty to care for other people, at least as a minimal kind of, in a minimal regard. And being informed by this idea of minimal altruism, she says, you can actually carry out a bare level of good Samaritanism by just going and casting your vote. Um, and what she'll say is voting for justice, or at least voting against things that are likely to promote injustice. She also says voting is a duty of common pursuit. This is somewhat self-explanatory. Well, we're all in the polis together. We all have this political community. And so that means that we have to actually participate in order to get this common pursuit off the ground and, and you know, to where it should go. And then the last one, I think, is actually the most compelling one. And that's voting is morally special. She says, yes, there are many different ways to contribute to democracy or to advance justice or to be civically engaged. And we should do all of these different kinds of things. But voting does something that none of the rest do. Puts people into power. Voting creates the governments. And so that means that there's something about voting that's morally distinct from all the other ways that you can engage in society, engage in politics. And so she says that this is another reason why there's a duty to vote. And so uh, here Maskever says the central case in this book is that a natural duty of justice requires citizens to acquire minimal epistemic competence and vote with a sense of common good in order to support fair governance. So when we put this into the context of our two questions about voting, she says, is there a duty to vote? Yes. And is there a duty to vote in a particular way? Yes. To advance justice, support the common good, or at least mitigate injustice uh, at, the very, at the very least. But what's interesting about her argument is that she actually seems to reverse engineer an answer to the first question out of the second question. So she never anywhere in the book considers, is there just a duty to vote, regardless of, of what the content of the vote is? She says, well, you've got a duty to vote in a particular way, therefore you must have a duty to vote. So it's a very, I, I think they're too conflated, and I don't want to get too much into that, but I did want to raise that as an issue 
because it is kind of relevant to what I want to talk about today um, in, in the context of not voting. Now, we saw that Maskover says that a natural duty of justice requires you to vote and to vote in a particular way. And this raises the distinction between what we might call general duties or natural duties or general obligations or natural obligations on the one hand and special duties on the other. And these can kind of be considered, uh, you know, with sort of just a, a cursory exposition of these as, you know, natural duties being the, the obligations that we owe to other moral agents simply because they're moral agents. So this is the things that we might owe to other humans or, you know, we include non-human animals in here, right? Just because their status is part of the moral community, broadly speaking. Whereas special duties are things that we would owe to people because of distinctive relationships or distinctive identities or something like that where certain conditions would have to be met such that we would say, oh, well, then you have a special duty to them. A classic example is do you have special duties to your family members, right? Well, I couldn't say, well, I don't owe a duty to so-and-so, you know, a, a familial duty to them when they're not my family member. So one condition for me to have that duty toward them is to have them actually be a family member. If that condition is met, then I might have a duty in that regard. So special duties come with these specific kinds of conditions uh, that make them distinct. And I would say that voting duties, um, if they exist, have to be considered special duties that derive from the individual status as a citizen of a particular political community or some kind of relational thing. In other words, there would have to be some uh, conditions that would be met such that a duty to vote would hold or even a duty to not vote or any kinds of duties related uh, uh, to voting as such. And like I said, this distinction has not been made explicit in the literature, Maskever suggests that it, but never disentangles this, and I think by not doing so, conflates this idea or makes too quick of an inference from natural duties to special duties, and uh, and in that I think we can pause and sort of uh, um, examine it a little bit a little bit more uh, clearly. And so here I'll establish a kind of modern modified version of Maskever's thesis. Right? She says, a natural duty of justice requires citizens to acquire minimal epistemic competence and to vote with a sense of common good in order to support fair governance. And I would say, we can modify this in a way and have it be just as compelling. A natural duty of justice requires citizens to acquire minimal epistemic competence to know when voting will actually contribute to injustice and thus to know when they have a duty to not vote. That's why I think the too quick of a conflation between natural and special duties gets us into a kind of tangle here. And that's why I think we can sort of revise this thesis and come out with something that's equally as compelling. And I have a little diagram here to show what I mean by this. So Maskever seems to suggest that the natural duty of justice entails a duty to vote, which then she says should advance civic justice in some kind of way. But she doesn't really consider whether or not you might have a situation in which you say, I've got a natural duty to justice, and so I'm going to vote. But no amount of voting is actually going to produce that justice, that every vote, no matter what, ends up producing some wild civic injustices, and that that is sort of, sort of a, a, a necessary outcome, or it just happens to be the outcome every single time we carry out this duty. Well, it seems to me that the natural duty of justice couldn't possibly entail a duty to vote if the outcome is always injustice. This would seem to be a really weird contradiction. And so what I want to uh, sort of entertain here is, even if we agree with Massacre, which I sort of implicitly do, that there might be a natural duty to justice of some kind, that we can't derive a duty to vote out of that as a blanket statement. And she accepts this. She says, under the assumption that the machinery of the elections works transparently, well, what if we don't accept that assumption? What if we challenge that assumption? Or what if we say, yes, in the abstract, this is true, but it is not true in practice? Or we take any political system and do a sociological, social scientific analysis of it, and we turn out, well, it doesn't actually meet this condition here. So anyway, she says, under this assumption, voting to elect minimally decent governments in episodic elections is one reasonably easy way to contribute to relieving society from the evils of injustice and incompetence, although it is by no means the only or most effective way under all possible circumstances. 
And my question to her is, well, what are these other circumstances such that might hold such that there might be this other duty that's been not explored? And in parentheses here, she says, if injustice is so rampant that rebellion is the only alternative, or if elections are a mere facade to disguise a de facto authoritarian regime, for example, then voting as a collective act turns futile, dangerous, and possibly non-obligatory, ethically speaking. And even here, I think the language is a little bit too held back because I would want to revise this and say possibly even not morally permissible at all, right? Go a little bit farther. Not only does it just become or, or, or sort of uh, transform from obligatory to permissible, but that it might actually trans, uh, transform from obligatory into prohibited behavior, um, uh, ethically speaking. Or at least that's the kind of thing I'd like to uh, consider in this talk. And so with that, I want to turn to three perspectives on the duty to not vote. And just as a, a disclaimer here, I don't think that any of the philosophers that I'm about to discuss come out and explicitly say, you've got a moral duty to not vote. I wouldn't want to project that into their philosophies. I don't think they say it explicitly. I just think that if we take their analysis and critique seriously, that we could infer that in practice there may be, under those conditions, a duty to abstain from voting altogether. And the three philosophers I'll talk about, of course, are Neil Deloitte and Carl here. So in this little uh, triumvirate, we'll start with Veal, and I'll refer to her view as an, intrin sorry, an intrinsic critique of political parties. In other words, her argument is that political parties are inherently problematic. Their mere existence, presence, undermine our work within a democracy to aim for justice, goodness, truth, whatever we're actually trying to achieve through the democratic process. That political parties are entirely antithetical to that, and to the extent that we have political parties, we just don't have democracy. That's the that's the. So let's take a look here. Uh, this is from her essay on the abolition of all political parties. It comes in a little pamphlet like this. It's pretty cool, highly recommended. Very, very cool read. And this essay is from 1943. And Beale says, look, we've got justice, goodness, and truth. These are the things that are intrinsically good ends. These are the things that we're always um, uh, striving for. And democracy is instrumental, or at least can be instrumental, to those intrinsically good ends. So in modern uh, theories of, of democracy, there's different justifications. What makes democracy desirable? Some philosophers say, well, we can take a proceduralist position and say there's something inherently good about having fair procedures such that democracy has its own value despite the ends that we might try to achieve with it. And instrumentalists will say, well, democracy is really only good as a tool. It doesn't have any inherent worth. So if democracy gets us the ends that we want, then it's, it's a good tool, you know, it's, it's, it's meeting its telos, it's flourishing, and therefore it's good. And if it's not getting us the end that we want, it's a bad tool, well, then we need to discard it and try some other kind of means. Field here would be uh, an instrumentalist. And she uses Rousseau's social contract theory to say that there's actually two necessary conditions for democracy. So this is her reading of Rousseau. She says, first, there must not exist any form of collective passion. And my sense is that she's reading Rousseau in this way. Rousseau thinks that if you join a group and say, yeah, we're going to do this, what you're doing is mediating the individual through some kind of organization. Political parties, I think, are, are a paradigm of this for Rousseau. And what you're not getting is the free judgment of, of an individual person exercising their reason without the sort of influence of, of various kinds of social factors. What you actually get is, you know, uh, groups that say, we've got some common cause, but this subgroup with this common cause is actually going to be uh, pursuing its own interests that may not align with, you know, the general public interest or the public, uh, the general will, as Rousseau might call it. The second condition here, she says that people should express their, regard, uh, their will regarding the problems of public life and not merely choose among various individuals, or worse, 
not merely choose among various irresponsible organizations. So this means that on this conception, right, Rousseau would say, look, to have democracy, you need each citizen to come out and say, here is what I think ought to be done about a problem, not, I like those guys over there, or they've got the right letter or right color by their name on the, on the TV Chiron, and so therefore, like, that's the person I'm a fan of. Right? Because that would be mediating these kinds of things through these sort of social symbols which would devalue that. And so this idea that people should come out and express their views about the problems of public life without just sort of championing this person or this group. Now on this reading she says, merely to state these two conditions required for the expression of general will shows that we have never known anything that resembles, however faintly, a democracy. So it's not just that Oh, well, these would be the conditions that we see. She says, no, in, in modern Western cultures, we have never seen anything like democracy if these are the conditions, because these conditions have never been upheld by modern Western political institutions. But if we wanted democracy, how would we get to it? Well, as the title of the essay suggests, abolish all political parties. She says there's three essential characteristics to political parties. First is, a political party is a machine to generate collective passions, which means that political parties are already diametrically opposed to the first condition of democracy. There should be no collective passions anywhere. So if political parties are supposed to generate those things, they're already antithetical to this Rousseauian understanding of democracy. The second characteristic of political parties is that political parties are an organization designed to exert collective pressure upon the minds of its individual members. Well, if every individual is supposed to come out and state what they think about uh, problems in their political society um, uh, without these kinds of pressures, well, this second characteristic of political parties also in contradiction with that second condition for the existence of a democracy. And so finally, she says, the first objective and also the ultimate goal of any political party is its own growth without limit. And taking these three characteristics together she concludes, because of these three characteristics, every party is totalitarian, potentially, and by aspiration. Regardless of the content of their platform, or what they say they value, which she will also say is always completely incoherent. You can never quite pin down what a political party really stands for, she'll say. So the idea here is that political parties are inherently anti-democratic, but also anti or, or say antithetical to achieving justice, truth, goodness, these other kinds of intrinsic goods that otherwise we would want to try to achieve out of a democracy. And so she says, when a country has political parties, sooner or later it becomes impossible to intervene effectively in public affairs without joining a party and playing the game. Whoever's concerned with public affairs will wish, to, wish his concerns to bear fruit. And those who care about the public interest are kind of caught in a dilemma. On the one hand, they can forget their concern and turn to other things, abandoning civic engagement altogether, or they can submit to the grind of the parties. And if they do the second thing here, if they do the latter, they, she says, they'll experience worries that soon supersede the original concern for the public interest. And to just give an example here, she says, every political party says it has the public good, the common good in mind. But really, every political party has its own growth and power in mind. And if you engage in the grind of the party, eventually you'll start to forget about justice, truth, goodness, and start only being concerned. Is our party growing? Does it have power? Does it have money? Does it have members? Are people voting for us? And that becomes the all-consuming aims. Replacing the desire for justice, the desire for goodness, and that means that we would have to abolish political parties. Now, to translate this critique that Beale gives us into the talk here, I would say, well, if she's right about it, uh, political parties being intrinsically bad, intrinsically antithetical to democracy or to the things that we think democracy is supposed to achieve, then if we live in a political situation, a political um, system in which political parties exist, we would have a duty to refrain from participating in it. Otherwise, we're going to get sucked down the road that she's worried about here, and therefore forget about the ultimate aims of justice. And so just to put this in the context of like Maskever's argument, for instance, 
Massacre says, well, voting is a relatively easy way to promote justice. But if you have to do this through political parties, then you will never achieve justice if B was right. So this is the first perspective I wanted to bring up here is this intrinsic critique of political parties. But maybe this is a little too strong. Maybe you want to say, well, political parties can have their place in a democracy, and political parties can be a tool to promote justice. And so we might not want an intrinsic critique of them. Well, let's turn to Du Bois here, who gives us what we might think of as an instrumental critique of political parties. In other words, there are some situations in which the political parties do not, in fact, promote justice. They might. There might be some party somewhere that could do it under certain circumstances. But for Du Bois, in mid-20th century United States, writing in 1956, there are no political parties that can actually do it. So it's not that they're intrinsically incapable, but that they're uh, instrumentally, in this particular context, unable to do so. So in his 1956 essay, I Won't Vote, Du Bois opens the essay saying, look, here's what my strategy has been for my entire life. And remember, he lived to be in his 90s. He voted in a lot of elections where black people were allowed to vote during his lifetime. And he says, since 1989, I followed the theory, and this is you know, referring to another uh, essay that appeared in the nation that year, August 4th, 1956. And the argument there is from Sidney Lenz, right? Vote for a third party, even if it's hopeless, but if, uh, if the main parties are unsatisfactory, or if there is no third party choice, then you can vote for the lesser of two evils. And he says, of course, involved in on all of this for him is, what are the implications for black Americans? So, uh, but that's kind of the general strategy he said he followed for most of his life. But in 1956, the second quote says, I shall not go to the polls. I have not registered. I believe that democracy has so far disappeared in the United States that no two evils exist. There is but one evil party with two names, and it will be elected despite all I can do or say. And so, I mean, people are laughing because they're like, oh, has anything changed since the 50s? Yeah. Um, <laughs> Uh, and so, I mean, we'll see Du Bois' diagnosis of this here in a second, right? But the idea here is that, you know, there's not really a major party that is going to advance justice at the height of the Cold War, you know, in this context. And he says, well, look, even if you're not going to reject parties all the way, maybe a third party could still have a shot or at least play some important role. And he says in that year, well, if a voter organizer or advocates a real third party movement, he may be accused of seeking to overthrow this government by force and violence. Anything he advocates by way of significant reform will be called communist. And again, you know, everyone who voted for the Green Party is just a you know disciple of Putin, right? We see modern translations of these very arguments today. And so Du Bois says, look, even if you want to play the political party game, a third party actually doesn't have a chance in, in this context. And so he says, even voting for a third party isn't going to advance justice, advance social welfare, and so on. And for him, this is a matter of bipartisan corruption. He says, look, there's, there's anti-communism that is a consensus. So that means there's consensus on war and empire. War and empire are the primary uses of tax revenue. Taxes fall disproportionately to the poor and working classes. Then you have increasing concentrations of wealth and power. You have corporate influence, not only over education, but also law and policy. So this is the military-industrial complex that we've now come to call it. And of course, for Du Bois, his concern in the 50s is the neglect of black people and civil rights issues among both major parties. He says, in a real democracy, it would be easy enough to turn these parties responsible out of power. Yet it's not possible to do in the United States. If we really had a democracy, we would be able to get rid of the parties that are causing all these problems and install a different party. If that becomes impossible, you don't really have a democracy. And so Du Bois says, is the refusal to vote in this phony election a council of despair? No, it's a dogged hope. It's a hope that if 25 million voters refrain from voting in 1956 because of their own accord, and not because of a sly wing from Khrushchev, or Putin, or insert baddies, right? This might not make the American people ask how much longer this dumb farce can proceed without even a whimper of protest. And so here, again, Du Bois doesn't say, 
people have a duty to not vote. In fact, he says, are you voting Democrat? If so, why? Are you voting Republican? If so, why? What is the point of all of this? And I think what we would do then here is extrapolate and say, well, if Du Bois's intrinsic critique of political parties hold, then any situation under which we have something like Du Bois describes, we might have a duty to refrain from voting at all, lest we just lend more legitimacy to a kind of corrupt bipartisan um, uh, context or um, you know, advancing these corrupt parties that don't actually work towards justice or truth or goodness, but in fact work towards power and empire and wealth. So between Du Bois and Veal, we have both an intrinsic and extrinsic critique of political parties. And the last view I want to take a look at here is George Carlin's critique. And I call it a cynical, romantic critique of American culture because I think if you study Carlin closely and have read any uh, sayings or uh, activities attributed to Diogenes of Sinope, you'll immediately go, George Carlin is the Diogenes of our time, right? Uh, except for he's not out here pointing turd at people. So. Um, and so he's going to critique American culture in this kind of way. So in his 1996 HBO special, Back in Town, he has a piece called Free Floating Hostilities. And it's like a 20-minute piece, but the last two sections of it are really what we would focus on. This is his defense of politicians, you might be surprised to hear, and his critique of American public. And he says, look, if you have selfish, ignorant citizens, you get selfish, ignorant leaders. Simple as that. He says, everybody wants to complain about politicians. I will not. And why? Because these politicians are products of American society. They pass through all of our institutions and get elected by our citizens. He says, this is the best we can do. <laughs> We don't have people in this country who are ready to step up, who are capable of stepping up and saying, look, I'm going to be the virtuous person to come in and help fix the problem. I'm going to be genuine and actually care. We don't have people like that. Which is why he says we need a new slogan. The public sucks, fuck hope. That's the slogan. And he actually thinks, or implies, I think, if you read him as a cynic in this way, that the United States has a decadent culture, it produces morally vicious citizens, that are actually incapable of becoming the kinds of virtuous politicians that we might, in our ideal theory, want to see. And so he says that voting in the United States, at least at the end of the 20th century and maybe into the 21st century, is meaningless at best. At worst, it's dangerous because it would be complicit in a corrupt and unjust system. And he also has a counter-argument to this idea of if you don't vote, you have no right to complain. He says, well, people like to say this. If you didn't vote, you can't complain about anything that happened. You didn't participate. You didn't try. But where's the logic in that? He says, if you vote and elect dishonest, incompetent people, and they get into office and screw everything up, well, you are responsible for what they have done. You caused the problem. You voted them in. You have no right to complain. I, on the other hand, who did not vote, who in fact did not even leave the House on Election Day, am in no way responsible for what these people have done and have every right to complain as loud as I want about the mess you created that I had nothing to do with. And so, you know, this is kind of like a nice, ironic, you know, twist of the argument here, and, and we see, uh, you know, kind of the point he's making in the argument. But again, if we do an extrapolation, put him within the context of voting ethics, we might say, well, if all voting actually leads to more injustice, then every vote is complicit in the injustice that comes out. And if there's any moral duty to be found here, it may be that you have a moral duty to not participate at all, to not be complicit, and to not vote. Of course, Carlin, like the others here, is not necessarily explicit about the duty to not vote. But nevertheless, if we take the critique seriously, it's very similar to Du Bois coming at it from a slightly different angle. And the idea being here that um, on a, in a critique of American culture as kind of decadent and vicious, um, that we may have duties to not participate if we ourselves do not want to 
participate in and thus become decadent and vicious ourselves. So just to come back to the main thesis here, that a natural duty of justice requires citizens to, to acquire minimal epistemic competence to know when voting will actually contribute to injustice and to thus know when they have a duty to not vote. And I think here we can sort of consider these three perspectives, Beale's intrinsic critique of political parties, Du Bois' instrumental critique of political parties, and Caron's uh, sort of cynical romantic critique of American culture as three different ways of considering this idea that under some circumstances, if certain conditions are met, then we may have, in fact, a duty to abstain from voting at all. And if that's true, then that means what I've uncovered here, my research findings, so to speak, is that this is an entirely overlooked possibility within the, within the confines of considering what the relationship is between ethics and voting and a completely ignored question within the relationship uh, of these things among or within the, the academic literature on voting ethics. So just as a short recap, we took a look at the field of voting ethics and introduced the notion of special duties. I introduced a new question here. Is there a duty to not vote? And if so, what are the conditions that might be met in order to uh, have such a duty hold? And then we took a look at our three perspectives here of Neil Du Bois and George Carlin. That's all I have. Uh, I don't have a closing line, so instead I'll just take a small bow. Uh, and I'm under the impression we have until 4.30 for questions, yeah. right? Okay. okay, so we got like 50 minutes, and we'll just go ahead. Yeah, Mark. Okay, thanks, Patrick. Uh, what if uh, it's not possible to acquire enough uh, information? The states are such a complicated mess now. Maybe you could acquire information if you had 10 years. Uh, what do you do in the meantime? Just assume the best? Or? Uh, I'm going to take notes so I can use this in the book. No. <laughs> um, no, I mean, that's a good question. So in rephrasing mask versus thesis to sort of fit this new question, I adopt the language of, of um, you know, saying that there's sort of an epistemic uh, angle to this responsibility. But I should say that I'm not really invested in saying, like, well, people have a duty to know stuff. I want everybody to learn. Right? And be curious and investigate stuff and, and, and all that because those are things I value. Those are things I try to do myself. Um, but I would say that like the other philosophers that tackle this question and say, well, you have a duty to find out enough to make sure your uh, um, uh, vote is informed, or in this case, maybe your, your non-vote is informed. But I'm not going to tell you what that threshold is to say, oh, now you've known enough. I'm not going to say now what that threshold is necessarily. Um, I wouldn't even presume to know, uh, even probably on long reflection, because, I mean, epistemologically, I don't even know where I fit in, you know, with things. If there's something like facts that we can all know objectively, or if you know, it's turtles all the way down, or whatever, you know. So, um, so I'm not sure what the threshold would be for that. I do think. It's one of those things where we can say, well, I know it when I see it. Like, if you talk to somebody and they clearly haven't read what they're supposed to be reading or clearly haven't studied what they should be studying to find out about it, um, then we might say, well, you should study up, bud. But, um, but uh, at the same time, I, I think the more important thing here is saying, is, is sort of opening up a new line of inquiry to say, might we have a duty to abstain? Not just the option, not just saying, oh, well, you've got the right to vote, but you don't have to exercise it, just like you've got the right to bear arms or that you've got the right to free speech, you don't have to exercise them. Well, on the one hand, we might say, under some circumstances, you might not, or you might have a duty to not exercise a particular right, and maybe here this is a, a case like that. So that's kind of more what I wanted to explore, but the epistemic question, I think, is, is very important. Uh, to follow up on that a moment, is there a way in which we can perhaps say that the, the, there is a, a greater or lesser sense of that duty. Um, just you know, following along with the epistemological sort of issue, right? That 
becomes a little bit more complex perhaps now when you have these silos of information and or disinformation such that the hurdle, the epistemological hurdle to decide whether there is or is not truth becomes a little more, well, I just, I, it's just harder to tell them now. Mm -hmm. So does that sort of lower the, the, the standard and thus, you know, the epistemological question? Maybe I just, I don't have the good, or maybe I do have the good, not both, since, you know, the, the epistemological hurdle has so that's, that's one question. I've got mm -hmm. a little three, but I'll leave that one. Yeah, that's one other. Um, to the extent that we're dealing with um, ethics, I mean, it's query whether you know we have an ethical duty to one's self, right? But but in the, in the voting um, sort of relationship, right? Is there a way we can say that there is a special duty to to one's self to either vote or not vote? To the extent that, um, and I'm wondering if you. Ran into this. Mm -hmm. um, we say that you know you had the sovereign who would rule, right? And one of the things that democracy does, and the book does, is mm -hmm. sort of bestow that sovereignty to the individual citizen, mm -hmm. right? And that the exercise of the vote is then sort of an actualization of that kind of sovereignty, right? Is there a way in which we either <coughs> complete that self-actualization in voting, right, which you somehow deny if you don't vote, right, so you have this sort of lack of self-actualization, mm -hmm. right, um, I don't know. Yeah, no, that's actually a really, really great question. Um, so the other thing that I noticed that's missing from this, uh, that, that's missing from, from this literature is any discussion of referenda a ballot issue, a ballot initiative, right, propositions that we see on state ballots like in Michigan, Ohio, things like this. And one of the things that called my attention to this was that I currently live in Ohio, and in our election last fall, we had two ballot initiatives. One was for a statute that would decriminalize uh, the own, uh, owning or you know possessing and use of, of marijuana, cannabis, as it says in the law. And another one that was an amendment to the state constitution to protect various types of reproductive freedoms. Um, so enacting a statute by referenda or enacting a, um, uh, a constitutional amendment by referenda, these, I think, there's a far more compelling argument for a duty to vote precisely because there's not that mediation between parties, candidates, right, different sorts of ideologies or whatever the case may be. That's the citizens turning out and self-actualizing themselves and saying, this is how we will rule ourselves in a kind, in a kind of way. Um, I know not every state, for example, in, this, in the United States actually has referenda. I would just say that those states are less democratic than the states that do. Um, and so I would say that there's a far stronger um, argument to say that there's a duty to vote on referenda. And in that, I would say there's probably more self-actualization for the citizens than voting for political parties or something. I do say how that, however, with the caveat that I'm very suspicious of the notion of representation, so I'm a lot more sympathetic to Rousseau's critique of representative democracy um, than you know this idea that we'll put some people into the parliament and then they'll take care of it while we go about and do our bourgeois business, you know, like that kind of thing. Um, I, I'm pretty skeptical of that sort of thing, um, you know, from Rousseau, Tocqueville, whatever kind of political theory you want to take it from, and. Um, and so in that regard, I would say that if we wanted to say that voting for candidates or parties or anything like this to elect an office is part of the self-actualization of the citizen, we first have to answer this question of whether or not electing officials is actually part of that self-actualization. I would be very skeptical that that's the case. I think some good arguments could be made one way or the other. We could also try to be very practical and say, well, in the political system that we do have, that's how it works. So is that how we would do it in this system? And then we might say, okay, yes, yeah, so in this context, that might be the way, but maybe we've got the wrong system. I don't know, right? And so there might be some kind of um, conversation to have about that. But I do think that there's something politically and morally salient about the distinction between voting on referenda items and voting for candidates. Yeah. And so, um, um,
And so, yeah, yeah, I, but I, this, is a, this is a really good question. Yeah, for sure. Um, and I haven't really seen that come up other than in the civic virtue kind of context. Yeah. <clears throat> My name is Bertha. I'm actually a visiting faculty at the School of Interdisciplinary Studies. Um, I'm interested in this whole, uh, thank you very much, about this, uh, on what is your position on this work in ethics. I'm interested in this whole question of um, electoral integrity because when we are presenting, it just brings to hold to mind this whole debate of electoral integrity. Why do I say that? I'm coming originally, I'm originally from Kenya, and uh, uh, the whole part of my life has been in just all this pushing against authoritarian rule and practical sense, and also had many debates on <laughs> the integrity of the electoral process itself. So as you are presenting, I was just wondering how that connects, because I approach it more from a social science perspective, a more empirical debate about this integrity. But I always feel that there is this ethical dimension to it that we are not really pushing into. So I'm just wondering how your argument because there's also this debate about, I'm not going to vote, and then a very important you know, uh, pressure that you must vote, but we don't have either political parties and leadership, we just don't have people who are going to deliver. We can see, uh, and that's, I'm just saying what a lot of people say, just on just everyday talk. Um, and, and so I'm just wondering how that fits into this, I was, I was recalling that in terms of this notion of how does it link with electoral integrity mm -hmm. debate in the social theory or if there's any social theorizing, how different? Yeah. I know that in the, in the, in the, there's a whole literature in the public policy literature, this whole projects of constitutional engineering in, 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 the, in the global south and, um, and the debates of all these national referendums and, and constitutional uh, uh, processes, mm -hmm. new constitutional yeah, no, I mean, that that's, uh, I mean, I think that that's at the heart of it, right? Because, like, I think, you know, as, as the quote I had up from Masciver earlier says, well, when the elections are transparent, under this condition, then these kind of duties hold. But I'm not really going to consider situations under which, you know, these transparency or the elections, uh, election integrity, as you might say, you know, sort of holds up. And, and, and I think there's a tendency to do that in this kind of theory because it's easy to say, well, let's say that this condition holds. Well, then these are all the duties that would follow it from it, something like that. And then the empirical part doesn't actually have to be uh, uh, explored. Du Bois himself was a social scientist. And I would say not only is he sort of giving a sort of firsthand testimony of his experience voting in US elections, you know, uh, as a black man from the late 19th century through the mid 20th century, but um, he's also bringing the social scientific lens and saying, look, we can analyze this and say these elections have no integrity, or to the extent that the voter's choice actually might change this or that person or party in and out of office, it doesn't actually change the policy all that much. You can put a Republican in there, they're going to colonize Africa. You put a Democrat in there, they're going to colonize Africa because they're all trying to stop communism. And so there's this sort of uh, 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 sociological analysis, I think, it, that informs Du Bois' perspective at that time in his career, um, you know, just as a for example. And uh, the other thing I think, too, is that when we start getting into trying to identify what are the conditions that we need to hold such that a duty then is, you know, that you have a duty to act in a certain way. Well, we can say, if these conditions hold, then you have this duty, and that's nice. But then if we say, well, let's look empirically at the world and see, do the conditions actually hold? Then we have a whole empirical debate about that, because some people might want to say, well, for all its flaws, the United States still stands as a, as a, as a representative of what a true uh, democracy with integrity can, can be like for the world. Of course, we're not perfect, and nobody is. But nevertheless, this is a nice example of at least something that's on its way. It's got the right idea, even if it's got some flaws in the way that things work out here and there in the details. And then on the other hand, you might have somebody say, well, look, if these are the things that are supposed to be in place, 
based on my experience or my understanding, right, what I've learned about the, the social system that we have, is that these elections uh, lack integrity almost all the way down. And, you know, power relationships are what produce electoral outcomes rather than meaningful public will or something like this. And so, so identifying the conditions and then seeing if the conditions actually hold in real life those are two different kinds of things, the latter being empirical, and therefore the latter being much harder to, um, uh, to settle, I think, uh, in, in that way. And again, I would say that most of the time, I mean, you know, uh, you have all these reports of like, let's, let's rate the democracy of, you know, countries X, Y, and Z and go around, you know, and these are all Western standards, for one thing. But it's not even the standards that is necessarily the problem. It's the deciders that are the problem. Oh, well, this country isn't democratic. Why? Well, because they're hogging all the oil and they won't let us in. So there's also, you know, geopolitical uh, uh, power concerns, right? Uh, uh, international political economy comes into play in all of these things. And so, um, you know, empirically, that's where it begins to get dicey. And... Um, and I think that that's where, that's why a lot of the voting ethics stuff says, I'm not going to describe anything about our existing political situation. I'm just going to say, here's what, you know, in the abstract would hold if these things are to be consistent or, or, or something like that. But I actually think that we have to get into the, well, let's analyze, let's diagnose actual political um, uh, systems and, and, and see what holds. But I don't know that there's an easy way to have consensus on that. You know, I mean, just in, in my own adult life, I've been, you know, dealing with this for 15, 20 years, having conversations with people about trying to say, well, don't you think that this is corrupt or whatever? And a lot of times it's, well, it's not perfect, but it's pretty good, you know, and, and I don't, I don't know, you kind of run into a wall with that, at least in my experience. Um, and so, yeah, so I, I do think the empirical part is necessary, but that's where it gets difficult. And a lot of times the ethicists just say, well, I'm not going to get into the empirical part and, uh, and I wish, I wish they would, although I understand why they might not want to, because it, it becomes difficult at that point. So yeah, but the, I, that's uh, at the center of my concerns about this too. So yes, thank you. Yeah. I still feel like I'm not Oh yeah, oh, which one? Sorry. You, yeah, you were helping me. Mark and Ronald here. Yeah, 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 we can do this a little bit and then come back around. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, I was going to ask, um, usually not voting gets conflated with like laziness or apathy uh, to a certain thing, and I feel just from my own personal experience, whenever people talk about not participating in a vote, you get the response of, well, like, oh, well, if everybody said that, then this would have turned out this way, and your vote matters, etc. Um, but it's really difficult to really accurately measure the utility of an individual vote. Um, and it seems to me more that uh, it's not just the individual vote that counts, but more so the uh, organization and the involvement with a larger movement, et cetera. So uh, I, don't know, I don't know if this goes beyond what you're trying to answer, but uh, is there discussion of not just a duty to vote or not vote, but a, a duty to organize and educate and defend those stances? Yeah. Um. Yeah, so um, in, in one other talk I recently gave on this, you know, it came up sort of like, well, if you have a duty to vote, or in this case a duty to not vote, do you also then have, like, uh, corollary duties with those? Like, well, do you have a duty then to help people understand, to learn, right, to raise the epistemic awareness of, of the actual situation or, or whether or not this action will lead to justice or injustice and that sort of thing? And... Um, you know, or to help other people. If there's a duty to vote, do you have a, do you have a duty to help drive people to the polls and that sort of thing? Um, I, th those are very interesting uh, questions as well. I don't know that I have like solid answers on, on some of that. Uh, toward in, in response to the the first part of your question about voting, non-voting as apathy. Um, so some people like Max Gruber will say, well. Some people would want to argue that not voting is a way of registering their displeasure or their opposition to the status quo. It's their way of saying this is a vote of no confidence in the existing parties or in the existing choices or in the, assist in the existing system as a whole. And she says, 
But if you have person A who doesn't vote for these very principled, thought out reasons, and then you've got person B who doesn't vote just because meh, you can't tell the difference between these, right? And so she considers, well, you know, what if you go to the poll and cast a, a spoiled ballot, is what you call it, right? One that's just blank or, or, or something like this. Or um, in conversation earlier, we were talking about some uh, um, uh, countries or, or spaces where there's uh, a spot where you can say none of the above, right? Uh, e, none of the above, that sort of thing. Um, and then that would be a way of dif differentiating the person who didn't vote from apathy to the person who's going to the vote to register their complaint. She does, uh, she does um, uh, uh, toy with that idea, and I do think that there's merit to that, and I do think that in a context where that option is available, um, that that would be another alternative to the not voting, or maybe a step you take before you get to the pure uh, abstention, right? Um, I have never voted anywhere, you know, I've lived in Michigan and Texas and Ohio, and I've never voted anywhere where I've had the option to say none of the above. So when I didn't want any of them, I left it blank. Um, and so, uh, and so I do think that there are that there is something important to be said about you know a principled protest vote versus you know a, a non-vote from apathy, and and that is a it, that's an analytically important distinction. Um, but I also think that. We can think about root causes too, like, well, why the apathy? Where does that come from? And uh, that might tell us something else about the political system too. So even just knowing the difference doesn't mean, well, this person voted principally, whereas this person was just lazy or apathetic, and so this person is justified and this person isn't. I think apathy can be a justification because it could actually reflect something about the broader <coughs> social system, political system itself. Um, but again, if we don't have very specific data to differentiate those, we might have a harder time learning what those things mean. So yeah, 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 very good. Um, yeah, uh, very good insight there. Thank you. Um, so I, I, I can get on board with um, feeling like it's not permissible to vote given, say, you just have like two candidates. And of course, now I'm talking just with and not you know, voting on certain policy, but voting on candidates. Um, where either either person is for a certain political party, part of a collective passion, and thus, you know, the person who gets elected, no matter who it's going to be, they're going to want to advance their party's interests and whatnot. But potentially, what if you have a situation where you have one political candidate to where if they get elected, there's a high likelihood that that outcome will lead to some sort of like dismantling of the system uh, because of um, you know the different factors involved. So to give you like an example of this kind of logic, um, you know, Stalin was very much trying to encourage inter-imperialist war during like the pre-war period of, of World War II because he figured, look, the uh, imperialist war from 1914 to 1918 seriously contributed to there being a socialist revolution with viable success um, in 1917 Russia. And so if we can encourage another imperialist war situation, maybe we can have an expansion of this in Germany, in France, in England. And I would be sympathetic to someone who says like, okay, so this is the strategy of the insane gambler. You know, um, you know perhaps this is, that's just, just kind of a, a disconcerting giant inference to think, oh, let's just, let's just vote this person in. I know they want to pursue their party's interests, but let, 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 let's see what happens and, and see if like the chaos that results from it can remove the system that makes me not want to vote in the first place. Well, what would be your reaction to that? Acceleration. Yeah. Is that uh, acceleration? acceleration? Yeah, acceleration. Yeah, yeah, right, Good. yeah. So, um, I mean, these kinds of accelerationist views can be fraught, I think, in the context of, of, of like, you know, Stalin, for instance, um, you know, provoking provoking a war amongst the capitalist powers, you would say, yeah, like that's going to disrupt those capitalist countries. But at the same time, you still have. I mean, it's called a world war because, I mean, it happened throughout all of the colonized territories. It con they conscripted colonized peoples into the armies. I mean, you know, it wreaked havoc all around the world. And in that way, 
this is one I, one I think of the, the one of the most uh, salient critiques of accelerationist uh, views. And if you haven't heard this phrase before, right, it's the idea that you try to cause turmoil within a political um, uh, system such that it will collapse faster and then make room for the next thing that will be more just than, than the existing situation, right? But one of the most salient critiques of this view, I think, is that under certain circumstances, it's usually not the most vulnerable people that are advocating the accelerationist mm -hmm. view, right? So uh, on the one hand, we might read somebody like Fanon, think about Algeria, and go, well, if accelerationism there is actually going to hasten decolonization, maybe. But that might be because it's coming from the colonized people themselves, right? And not like Stalin, mm -hmm. right, who usually uh, can't be reached by phone for, you know, comment. Um, and so, you know, and who's not going to be affected by these things principally, right? So that, I think, is, is, is one of the, the, the big concerns there as well. Um, so I am never comfortable with an accelerationist view unless it's coming from the people who are already the most vulnerable saying, this is the way to get us out of our most vulnerable state, right? Mm -hmm. In which case I might say, well, then that means that you're exercising your agency, you're exercising you know, your sovereignty or, or how we want to cash that out to say, all right, cool, then like, I'm not going to turn that down as an option. But I wouldn't advocate it myself knowing that my advocacy of it actually puts, you know, uh, more vulnerable people in further danger against their will. Right. Yeah. Right, so right. I, that's the distinction I would make there. Right, right. So, um, yeah, good. Yeah. Very good. But sometimes you need a little chaos. Right. You know? <laughs> I just don't think it should be at the expense of others, right? right? right. If you want the chaos, get your ass right. in there and get the chaos, right? Right, right. Yeah. So, yeah. Okay. Um, do we have, was that all the hands over here? No, it, it was not. It, yeah, it was very similar to what he was um, okay. talking about. Okay, cool. All right. I just I thought there was one more hand. Yes. I mean, I guess the other thing that I was thinking about, this is probably beyond the scope of what you're talking about, because it gets into the, the whole question of who votes for something, but you don't know how the vote turns out. Because I have seen in an academic, um, environment where somebody had something they wanted to railroad through. And so they asked for public opinion on it, asked the public to, or even something they've already railroaded through, what does the public think about it? And, but yet you never find out what that public vote turned out to be. I mean, specifically, you don't have a way to verify it. Um, but they use you as a rubber stamp in essence. And so, but, but that gets into the, um, the, um, the actual election process itself. And, which goes back to as an elected um, official or you know, even a representative type official, you have a duty to your to those whose opinions you seek to you know to provide transparency for what has been given to you. Mm -hmm. You know, like for example, if you um, railroad through a policy in a school system and it was very unpopular at the time, and now two years later you go out to the public and say, well, you know, what do you think of this policy? then don't you have an obligation to be honest in reflecting what they tell you rather than just never sort of mentioning that and keep it on with the policy. Yeah. Oh, they don't like, you know, it's not, yeah. We yeah. ask them. That's because, all you need to know. Yes, because, <laughs> because to a certain extent, if once you realize you're being used as a rubber stamp by someone or by an institution, then, you know, I've decided that I'm not going to participate in that. Mm -hmm. You know, you can get your credit turnout rate of 3% and... You know, yeah. from there. But then that gets back to, I think it was Brewster's Millions, where he encourages people, you know, vote for nobody, you know, mm -hmm. or none of the above, that sort of thing. Yeah. Um, and that gets back to what Carter was saying about yeah. how do you distinguish, and, and John, about how you're distinguishing between apathy and, and between, mm -hmm. uh, you know, active, you know, disgust with your, your option. Right. And uh, maybe for those who've never heard this before, uh, when I was a an undergrad here, Professor Cornish in the uh, in the political science department uh, told me this. This is not his quote. He was quoting someone else. I don't remember who it was, uh, but it was, uh, "Stop voting. You're only encouraging the bastards." So you know, <laughs> if you're, never heard that one, right? Yeah. But he was saying, "Oh, this is so so and so's view." I don't think he was endorsing it. You know, I don't want to get fall in trouble. <laughs> um, yeah, Ron. Uh, I'm seeing a Sakawa that was a question about you. Oh, okay. <laughs> I, uh, uh, my question was uh, following up on John's uh, that uh, 
a little differently than the other. If you do have a duty to not vote, then it, it seems like you have an obligation to prevent others from voting too. Mm. And I, su I suppose mm. if, if it was, uh, you know, you asked enough injustice, you could get a you know, referendum item oh, if you want to reintroduce uh, slavery in the United States. Uh, but I'll say no, it's, uh, <laughs> I guess I'll vote it down. But, uh, I don't know. <laughs> oh God! Yeah, and I mean, and that actually raises the question of the distinction between a duty to vote and a right to vote, which is pretty well discussed in the literature in the sense that, at least like Brennan and Masquever here in, in the books that I that I referenced here, they're both going to say, look, I'm not saying that people ought to not have a right to vote, like, you know, anybody that within the confines of the political system have been deemed uh, uh, you know, to have this right, ought to have it, and no one should interfere with the exercise of those rights. And then, of course, Brennan says there is no duty to actually exercise the right, whereas uh, um, Masquever says, well, you have a right to vote, but you also have a duty to do it and to do it in this, kind, in this particular way. Um, and so it might be that in this particular case, we might say, well, if you have a duty to not vote, you may have a duty to articulate that position to others such that they may learn from you, but you also have a corresponding duty to their right to vote to not interfere with the exercise of their right. Um, and so that might be one way to kind of get us out of this, you know, weird thing where, you know, uh, I don't know what we're doing, like tying people up to bicycle racks or whatever <laughs> <laughs> to prevent them from going in. <laughs> Right, drying out all the markers. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm actually kind of curious, you know, about what you all think about Beale's entrance critique of political parties. Like, do we think that political parties, in and of themselves, actually distract from what might be the greater ends of democracy, the public good, justice, truth, things like that, uh, or could they be compatible? Um, with democracy and those ends that democracy, you know, is supposedly is supposed to be. Is there something intrinsically wrong? It's not just incidentally at this particular point in time, the political parties are working this way. It's, just, it's a matter of principle. Like political parties, in principle, uh, obstruct. Yeah, I think following Rousseau's analysis in the social contract, um, that's that's her position on that. Um, whereas Du Bois would say. Look, like you might have parties that do the kind of work that are supposed to be done and actually do advance these aims of democracy. Uh, it just turns out that the existing ones don't do that, right? I think that's the difference between Beale and Du Bois on um, that question. Um, and, uh, and, and I kind of go back and forth, being very interested in the idea of political organizing, but at the same time, what if political organizing means generating collective passions and subsuming individual judgment to like groupthink of some kind, that might, you know, sort of raise those 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 dangers. It seems to really happen in the case of unions and union leadership it left the, the, the rank and file behind. I mean, it, was, you know, it was a disgrace. Um, the old, but that was nineteen forty three, right? So to some extent was that influenced by Hitler's rise to power and um, the fact that, because if you think about what's the purpose of a political party, part of that purpose is to vet the candidates so that, because they get a more intimate look at them um, early on, so that you, know, you, you look at a candidate and if there are things about this candidate that are you know, unsavory, um, not just from the party standpoint, but from in general, things that the public might not necessarily be able to readily ascertain, um, then the party one of the things that the party can do is not advance those candidates so that it's a me mechanism for um, like weeding people out, which of right. course can work you know, in many ways. But yeah. um, because at the time that she's writing, it's you know that World War II era, I'm just kind of wondering to what extent that viewpoint is affected by you know, Hitler's rise to power. Because yeah, it was I done think, through a party. Yeah, I think um, Hitler, and Stalinist communism are, are both play a prominent role there uh, in, in her analysis. Um, 
but also, you know, uh, she doesn't seem too keen on, you know, kind of tepid liberal socialist sorts of parties either. So um, I, I think it's the the it's the the very practice of the parties themselves because one of the things she'll say is, you know, if you have somebody who's a member of a party and says, if I'm elected, I'm just going to use my best judgment and try to help solve the problem, you know, my party affiliation or the ideology or ideologies that are supposed to be attached have no role to play in any of this, that person would immediately become a, a, a pariah within the party and get booted. Whereas they're always expected to say, well, as a socialist or as a communist or as a liberal or as a conservative and always speak as, a, you know, something to represent the party and its sort of nebulous... Uh, uh, orthodoxy in that way. Um, that And there's another distinction right at the beginning of the book. Obviously, she's writing about the French context, and of course, 1943, you know, we know what that is, occupied and everything. Uh, but one of the other distinctions is that she sees a distinction between um, parties as they exist in continental political systems and Anglo-Saxon, uh, par par parties in Anglo-Saxon political systems. And she says that you know, parties are actually taken very seriously in continental systems, whereas in Anglo-Saxon systems, these are like, you know, uh, sort of have handed down to them the idea that these are aristocratic games to play. So she actually thinks that parties are more serious in continental Europe than they are in the Anglo-Saxon the Anglo world. Um, I, applying her analysis to something like the United States, I'm actually being way more generous than she is. <laughs> so... Um, uh, or thinking about it just within the context of, of the United States, I'm being a lot more generous than, than she is in that regard, too. So she would say that, oh, yeah, like, my analysis doesn't really apply to the English-speaking world because those people don't take parties seriously in the first place. Those are just games. Here, right, there's something else going on. And so there's, a, there's another distinction in there that, um, you know, I ignore for practical reasons, but it, actually to be more, a little bit more generous than, than she is. So, um, yeah, well. Oh, um, yeah, just a comment on um, the mass collective system, the form of collective passion. You know, one could distinguish between two kinds of collective passion. One generated through manipulation and propaganda, right? Or maybe, maybe, maybe raising scapegoats, culture wars, things like that. Uh, but there could also be a form of collective passion that is generated through a process of so called democratic deliberation, for example. Talk about certain ballot initiatives, so I feel this is too strong that there must not be any of this to me, and, and so making this distinction may, um, could be helpful. Yeah, I mean, so I my impression is is that Veal's reading of Rousseau would say that the sort of propaganda generated collective passion is what is is sort of encompassed by the term collective passion, mm -hmm. and a sort of proper democratic initiative, something like that, that's the general will. And I think for Rousseau, you can't get to that if it's mediated through these subgroups, right? It has to be sort of every individual of the public expressing themselves authentically, straight up into, you know, uh, in, into the, uh, what, what would you call it when everybody comes together? The gathering of something, right? Where everybody comes out and, that talks about the, the public issues and then casts a vote in person, right, rather than through representative. Uh, I think that second thing, right, we might think of, oh, yeah, well, that's a collective thing because it's the general will. But I think for Rousseau, the collective, uh, the general will is supposed to be the product of reason. And the collective passions are actually uh, get in the way of, of reason. I think that's how she's reading Rousseau on that. Um, and so there might be, you know, depending on how we want to interpret Rousseau, maybe there's some liberties there with what she's taking from him, um, but she puts it in those kinds of terms. So yeah, the idea that a collective passion and the general will actually both originate in different parts of the self, but also are, are uh, articulated through different processes, right? Whether a subset of the society or through the entire populace showing up to cast their vote um, you know, as part of the um, Part of the public. Yeah. a cynical view about parties then, that <laughs> yes. necessarily by the nature of this is run up collective passion. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> yeah, and I mean, and I and I do think that there is at least a seed of that idea in Rousseau. So it's not like, oh, this is a wild reading of Rousseau or anything. Yeah. So, of course, I'm trying to think of examples where every outcome is one chance. You still might have a duty to vote. So let's start with what I think is an easy one, and that is if your you know, child or your parent or your spouse is running, and they have like a familial duty to vote. <laughs> Right, it's not a duty out of justice or creating a just society, but it's like an individual for a duty to them. Okay, so that seems plausible. And then say I am a developer of low-income housing in Grand Rapids, and I know all, everyone I work for is corrupt, but some people are corrupt in a way that will help me. Right? Don't I have a duty to the people of Grand Rapids who could really benefit from low-income housing? Now it's not a duty for the sake of bringing about a just society. But it's a different kind of duty. It's a specific duty to a specific group of people. Could that be a way in which you can start to sort of see justifications for duties for voting, even though none of the options bring about a just society? Because the duty is no longer a duty to create a just society. The duty is some other specific duty to a specific group. Yeah, I mean, so, uh, I mean, yeah, that's a, that's a very interesting um, question to ask about this in that, well, if we change the, the aim or the outcome, right, like, like what the duty is to create, not necessarily a just society as a whole, but achieving justice in particular contexts or for particular parties in that way, then um, I could see uh, cases where that, that would be, that that would hold. And um, one other thing that, of course, is not brought up in, in any of these uh, in any of these academic texts, but something I've been thinking to myself is a question between, you know, in a system like the United States, local, state, federal levels, are there different kinds of duties at these different levels, you know, and in that case, it might, it might be, well, you do have a duty to go out and vote for mayor and city council because those things are actually going to change, you know, get projects like that realized within your local community. And then you might have a duty to abstain at the federal level because, of, oh, well, that's actually not going to lead to anything. And so then it might be that the abstention to vote, again, having certain conditions that have to be met, might actually mean that, well, you could have a duty to simultaneously vote in this context and to not vote in this context. So I also, one of the things that I don't want to claim is that, well, if you have a duty to not vote, then you just have to, like, not engage in anything at all because if the duty to not vote has conditions, then that means that if you don't, if you say I have a duty to not vote on this, those conditions hold there, but they might not even hold on a different part of the ballot. Mm -hmm. And so, in that way, that kind of distinction amongst different levels, different offices, you know, within a federal system or whatever, um, uh, that I think is also morally salient. This might be a place where that where that plays a role. Mask of Brennan. They haven't discussed this distinction at all, and I think this is another one that needs to be brought in uh, to the conversation because if Masker wants to say there's a duty to vote, well, what about the differences between voting for mayor, voting for governor, voting for president? Those distinctions actually do seem to be really morally important, whether we think about this you know, just from a duty perspective or the outcomes of the elections and, and so on. And in that way, I would actually be open to the idea that you could go in skip part of the ballot, say I have a duty to ignore that, but I also have a duty to fill this one in. And then of course, if we say that you have a duty to vote in a particular way, to vote for the common good, or vote for justice or whatever, then you can say not only do I have a duty to fill in this section and cast a vote for that piece, but also to vote for this person because they're the one that's most likely to bring about this outcome or whatever. So that's another, uh, that's another distinction that I want to eventually introduce into this project. This, this bigger project is, is sort of like the question of the federalist um, uh, structure, because I do think that careful distinction makes it a lot more interesting in the way that, that you're talking about here, where it might be, well, it's not so much to create a just society, but to get a specific, a specific justice done in this moment. And, um, and I think these are some hard questions that just haven't been raised in, in the academic stuff on this. So yeah, that, that's that's a very helpful that's a very helpful way to, to think about it. Yeah, thank you. Uh, oh, sorry. Oh, 
Sorry. No, you would always. Um, I was going to ask something uh, kind of in the same vein of like the difference between voting locally versus federally, and also with the critique of political parties is um, it kind of seems impossible for a national political party to truly represent the ideas of the individuals within it because I mean as you get larger, so many more different perspectives come into play, and so many more different sets of values are applied, but. To me, I guess I would say it feels as though a political party becomes more and more ethical or reasonable at a smaller scale. Um, so I don't know, that might be worth taking into consideration with the change of critique. Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, that, that could be. I mean, uh, probably the greater scope of the collective, the collectivity that is generating its collective passions probably makes it uh, more harmful and also uh, less coherent or, you know, whatever we want to say about in terms of achieving what their openly stated ideals seem to be or whatever. Whereas, like, maybe on the local level, you could have, you know, a party like, oh, let's go down to Allendale and we just have our, like, you know, little local Allendale party or whatever. And that might be slightly different. Um, and, and, that, and that's an interesting thing that I had not considered before in terms of, well, if we map on the party stuff to the federalism stuff, does it look different in, in those in those uh, cases? And uh, and I would be kind of open to that. Like I said, I do think that the way parties work is exactly the way that Veal describes. Just given that, like you know, in my own personal journey, right, to kind of take a Du Boisian analysis or, or, or angle on this, you know, my own personal journey in politics, I was like, yeah, like I want to like get engaged and stuff, and then seeing like. Well, major parties aren't don't really have a space for me because every time I raise some question, people are like, "Oh, you can't ask that. You just got to get in line." And I'm like, "Well, I'm not going to do that." So then you think about third parties, and you're like, "Oh, there's more space because these people consider this over here, but then there's still kind of orthodoxy there." And then you look at even smaller parties, and there's even more orthodoxy. And it's almost like the smaller you get, the more orthodoxy is in, is uh, um, uh, enforced because that's the way the party protects itself. And of course, then you get splinterings off. I mean, you know, we see like the, the Trotsky style about it, you know, like, and so you get this sort of splintering off and then you do have small parties and they're all really orthodox. And, you know, if you start questioning those orthodoxies, then you get kicked out and that sort of thing. So on the other hand, I, I don't know that just having a small local one solves the problem. And in some cases, it may exacerbate it. Um, and just as a citation, uh, I have in mind uh, C. Wright Mills, The New Men of Power, where he analyzes sort of like uh, uh, left-wing politics in the 40s and so it shows that like the smaller the group gets, the more orthodox uh, it, it, it requires, the more orthodoxy it, it requires you to conform to. So, um, so yeah, so it might actually be the opposite of, of that sort of thing. And, uh, yeah, Rob. So thank you, thank you. Um, this is a follow-up on David's point, just to reiterate that I was thinking too, how you spell out the special duties seems like it's going to be very important because at the beginning it sounded like you wanted to, to say, right, this is grounded in a special duty, um, which is understood in terms of individual citizens of particular political communities, which is already pretty restrictive, right? So that's already saying something. But then as you were going through the perspectives and then in your Q&A, um, it sounded like there was a different, different moral frameworks were being used to justify some of your answers. Some of them sounded more consequential, like something like promoted social welfare, make sure something like uh, the most vulnerable uh, participants in the society aren't harmed as much as they could be. Um, and then it also sounded like there was kind of more general, like promoted just society. So, um, so yeah, I think that how you, can you say more about how your, um, particularizing the special duties, um, because I think that is, yeah, going to get you some of the results that it sounds like you want in terms of this, not just being like a blanket, well, just don't cause injustice. Yes. <laughs> right. Okay. Um, so yeah, that, I think that could be helpful if you don't mind spelling it out more. Yeah. So part of the problem that I'm having here is that I'm inheriting, inheriting this sort of conflation or, or yeah. unclarity from the literature specifically massacre, because Brennan's book, I don't even know what the central argument of that thing is, right? Like, I got the one thesis that I'm like, okay, that's all you need is, is those two sentences. Massacre, I actually think, does a really good job at trying to develop out a whole theory on it, 
But because it's such a broad thing, it's like, well, you know, you should fight injustice and, right. and, and promote justice, and you've got a duty to do so because of minimal altruism. I'm like, okay, but that doesn't tell me anything in practice. It doesn't tell me, like, when I go to the polls, like, what do I do? She's like, well, I don't want to say that part. I'm like, but then it's not helpful, right? Um, introducing the, the distinction with the special duty stuff, what I'm actually trying to do there is say, this seems implied in what is written already, not fleshed out. I want to do that. Haven't done it yet, but that's what this is partly trying to do. And, and just as an example of, of something is that, uh, uh, an obvious example of like, here's why they have to be considered special duties. If I have a duty to vote, and I live in Fairborn, Ohio, well, I don't have a duty to vote in French elections. I don't have a duty to vote in California elections. I don't even have a duty to vote in Columbus. I've got a duty to vote in Fairborn, or the state of Ohio, or the United States, right, when my citizenship is called on to cast a ballot for those particular levels of government. So, uh, and that's sort of like the, the basic example I'm trying to use to say, if you haven't done this part yet, you haven't really fleshed out what a, what a special duty means. And then I do think that there would be other conditions there. I haven't figured out what they are yet, but I wanted to use that as an example to at least show that there's this really serious shortcoming in the existing literature, and that even bringing in something as simple as that completely changes the game. And in fairness to the authors that we talked about today, these two books are the two that exist on this topic, really. So it's, it is a very small field in that regard. And what I'm trying to do is say, okay, I'm going to just acknowledge what has been laid out here and then see if I can you know, crank it up to 11 and on all the different topics that, that, I can, that I can put my finger on. I might not even be able to answer questions along those regards, but to just change the way the questions are asked such that that opens up new lines of inquiry for the next people who come along. Um, and, and so uh, I, I, I actually don't know what all the conditions would be, but I do need to figure that out or at least make some suggestions or at least open the line of inquiry so somebody who's better at this than I can can answer that. Yeah. yeah. I don't know uh, how fruitful this would be, uh, so I'm throwing it there. Um, so I, I don't know if you know that in the previous, um, the, the primary survey, Put uncontested, right, as an option, mm. right, uh, for and, and um, in certain, in certain positions. And I'm wondering, as a thought experiment, if if every election had that option, right, to put uncontested, whether that be at the whatever level, was it uncommitted? Mm -hmm. Yeah, is it uncommitted or uncontested. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, okay. Um, if that would change how we go about answering the question, is there not vote, right? Like if I had the option to put uncommitted, right, um, all the way up and down, would that would that change my duty in any way, right? Like if I had an option to say, look, I don't like either one of I don't like these options you guys are throwing out, but I'm still a participant in this, right, or not? Mm -hmm. Would there be a duty? I mean, I don't know how fruitful that would be or not, but it might be something to oh, okay. well, to break out. I was thinking the same thing because I wonder if is in inner duty to vote or not vote is, could you say that a part of that is by voting uncommitted or any other way, like it's a way to signal to other members of society that this is your choice and like it, it's a, a public demonstration in a sense of not participating in these avenues that are going to be problematic. And yeah. so, because I wonder if we're talking about this right to vote as such, like, I mean, it is an, or right and duty to vote it is an individual thing, but because it takes place in society, you're not voting in isolation, you're voting as a member of society, so there's some connection between you and the rest of the voting population, so maybe choosing that sort of option is... Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's probably a, analogous to the you know going to the general election and saying none of the above, right? Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I think Simone Veal would say if you show up to a party primary, you've already made a mistake along the way somewhere, right? <laughs> um, oh, but uh, uh, but at the same time, if we if we sort of set that 
concern aside, um, then if we set that concern aside, then we might say, well, there's an analogy to be made between, well, I could vote uncommitted in the primary, and then if I go to the general election and there's no there's no uh, candidate that I can support, I can say none of the above and cast it that way. So then that way they can say, oh, there was X percentage of people who said we don't like any of them people, you know, that are running for office. And uh, and then again, that would bring us back to getting that distinction between apathy and a principled sort of position. Um, by the way, I'm also all for um, ranked choice voting. We haven't talked about that today, but let's do it, you know. Uh, I think we could get some pretty interesting stuff that way as well. Uh, well, we shouldn't do it now. Oh, yes, we are. Thank you all so much. And thank By the way, let's do one more topic. Now that we're at the end, should we start one yeah, more brand new thing? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, you know, thanks everybody. This is this was very great, very helpful. Um, I really appreciate the questions. Um, like I said, just looked at the literature on this. Said, no, this this can't be where we leave it. And if nobody else is going to come along and do something to ask these questions, I guess I'll do it. And you know, hopefully, it, it does a little something for us all.